Now that uh, we are on part 5, and I assume that you are already familiar with the definitions that we gave you about uh, famines in the Bible. And so today, we are going to tackle on one of those definitions, okay? And it's a famine in a form or as a form of judgment. Okay, now this is very important to know, okay? Uh, I know that it's not good for our ears. I mean, you know, uh, judgment is not uh, a nice word <laughs> for us, but uh, this is to show us and to caution us and to help us understand the, the, the character, the attributes of the living God. So this is very important because God is our maker. And we need to know what he likes, what he do not like, okay? Because one day soon, we are all going to stand before the throne. Okay, and be judged by him. So we need to know the criteria, the you know, uh, you know, we want to uh, pass or 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 say uh, have a positive result <laughs> when God will judge us or when we give an account concerning our lives. Okay, so okay, let's begin. Today, uh, we will talk about uh, famine in the time of David. And our scripture is uh, 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 21, uh, verse 1. It says, During the reign of David, there was a famine for three consecutive, uh, successive years. So David sought the face of the Lord. So th this, is, this is good. Because there was famine, but David, King David sought the face of the Lord. So, and the Lord said, It is on account of Saul and his blood-stained house. It is because he put the Gibeonites to death. Okay? The king summoned the Gibeonites, I mean David summoned the Gibeonites, and spoke to them. Now the Gibeonites were not a part of Israel, but were survivors of the Amorites. The Israelites had sworn to spare them. Okay? So, they should not be touched. But, it says, Saul, or King Saul, in his zeal for Israel and Judah, had tried to annihilate them. Okay? To destroy them. Okay, so they were bound to an oath not to touch this people group. But King Saul, okay, tried to destroy them. Now, verse 3 says, David asked the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? How shall I make atonement so that you will bless the Lord's inheritance? The Gibeonites answered him, We have no right to demand silver or gold from Saul or his family. Okay, so they do not ask uh, a restitution uh, uh, using gold and, and treasures or wealth. Since they said, nor do we have the right to put anyone in Israel to death. So they have no plan to do a revenge. So David asked, what do you want me to do for you? They answered the king, as for the man who destroyed us and plotted against us so that we have been disseminated and have no place anywhere in Israel, let seven of his male descendants be given to us to be killed. Now, this is serious. They asked for seven people okay, to be killed and their bodies exposed before the Lord at Gibeah of Saul, the Lord's chosen one. So the king said, I will give them to you. The king spared uh, Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of the oath before the Lord between David and Jonathan, son of Saul. But the king to, took Armoni and Mephibosheth, 
Oh, what's this? Mephibosheth and two sons of Ice, daughter Rizpa, whom she had borne to Saul, together with the five sons of Saul, daughter of Merab, whom she had borne to Adriel, son of Barzillai, the Meholathite. Uh, verse 9. He handed them over to the Gibeonites who killed them and exposed their bodies on the hill before the Lord. All seven of them fell together. They put to death during the first days of the harvest just as barely, uh, barley, sorry, harvest was beginning. Now, so on and so forth. You can read that and you will read in verse 10, Rizpa, the uh, daughter of Aia. You know how this mother protected the dead bodies of his sons. But, uh, you know, it, it's a sad story. It's, it's, it's a, it's, it was not a good time, okay, to, to see or to witness such, uh, such uh, killing. But this killing is just a, a, like a recompense or an, uh, uh, what do you call this, a restitution, okay? Um, uh, verse 14, let's just jump to verse 14. It says, they buried the bones of Saul. I mean, David. Okay, verse 13. David brought the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan from there, and the bones of those who had been killed and exposed were gathered up. They buried the bones of Saul and his son Jonathan in the tomb of Saul's father Kish at Zela in Benjamin uh, and did everything the king commanded. After that, now listen. Read verse 14, second part. It says, After that, God answered prayer in behalf of the land. After that, after the what? After the killing of the seven people uh, from the lineage of, uh, I mean, the family of King Saul? Yeah. You see, uh, so what do we learn from this type of famine? where a lot of uh, repercussions took place. I mean, we know that, uh, or, or it is clear that there was a recoil. There was a, a, a backlash of what King Saul did to the Gibeonites, right? So this is a consequence or an after effect with what the previous king did. Now, Okay, let us, you know, to cut the long story short, let us summarize it. Number one, it is clear that this famine is a form of judgment. Now, beginning from verse one, it is a form of judgment because of the previous king's wicked act. Remember, uh, what does it say? Verse one, the Lord said, you know, concerning the famine, the three successive years of famine, the Lord said, second part of verse one, it says, he said, it is on the account of Saul that his blood-stained house, it is because he put the Gibeonites to death. Where they should have not done it, okay, in the first place. Now, uh, where were we? Um, so, that's number one. Number two, it is clear that God is a God of retribution. Um, he is a just God and... Uh, and he will not let any act of wickedness go unpunished. Okay, because it's just. All right? What you saw, you will reap. I, I think we discussed, we discussed this also last week uh, about the famine during the time of Naomi. Okay, so now, number three, he is a God of restitution. It's like retribution, rest restitution. But restitution has something to do with... Uh, uh, restoring back what was lost, okay? It has something to do uh, with what has been taken that uh, it must be replaced, okay? Or repaid. A, a compensation must be uh, paid for, for the loss or for an injury. So that is what we meant by, uh, by restitution. And so therefore... Uh, since God is a God of retribution, you know, He's a just God, okay, and He will serve justice. Therefore, uh, there must be a restitution. It's a form, restitution is a form of uh, part of repentance, okay? 
uh, to restore back to its original place. I mean, a condition or 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 it is to uh, serve justice. That's that's part of it, right? And so, with what King Saul did, but you know, Saul, Jonathan are they died? They're dead already. And the the consequence of what they did during their lifetime affected okay the the family and it, it, it's not a good thing but uh, but this is this serves as a warning to us that God is a god of retribution okay i mean david knew okay look look did god told david to kill i mean to you know to kill seven people uh, because of what Saul did? No. But David knew that God is a God of retribution, that God is a just God. Therefore, he asked audience from the Gibeonites and said, Hey, please come over. Let's talk this over. Okay, let's talk it out. Let's negotiate. Okay, let's negotiate. That's right. So let's talk about this, uh, about this matter. I mean... We have done, we have sinned against you guys. I mean, through King Saul. Okay, so what can we do to uh, pay to pay you back for the for what the the previous king did to your people? And so they said, well, we we don't want to ask money. We don't, you know, we have no right to demand for money or this and that, or even kill anyone from Israel. But they asked seven lives. As a payment, as a restitution, you know, for the for all the killings. And so the king gave it. Why did David do that? Because he knew the Lord told him that this famine, okay, the three successive years of famine is due to what Saul did. And so somehow. It must be atoned for, okay? It must be, um, what's another word for atonement? <laughs> it must be uh, paid for, okay? So, that's why he asked uh, time or audience with uh, the negotiated with uh, the Gibeonites. And so, and so after that, okay, after that, uh, the Bible says in verse 14, after that, Okay, second part. After that, God answered prayer in behalf of the land. You see, uh, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And He does not change. But you see, even in this way, in the famine in the time of David, you know, we can learn a lot that, you know, just like Galatians in the book of Galatians says you cannot trick God, you cannot mock God, you cannot, uh, yeah, you cannot deceive God, you cannot. What's another word? I I forgot the word, but you know, you just can't escape. God knows everything, and what man saw, he will reap. Now, there was another famine, or another threat of famine during. Still during the time of David. Okay, but this famine did not happen and I will tell you why. So now let me read to you chapter 24, Second Samuel chapter 24. So our, uh, this is 21. So just three chapters after the ch chapter that we read earlier. Okay, so Second Samuel 24 verse 1 says, Again the anger... Of the Lord burned against Israel. Ooh, again. Okay, again. <laughs> and he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel and Judah. Huh? Okay. The verse 2 says, So the king said to Joab, Okay, uh, and the army commanders with him, Go throughout the tribes of Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, and enroll the fighting men so that I may know how many are there there are. 
But Joab replied to the king, May the Lord your God multiply the troops a hundred times over and may the eyes of my Lord the king see it. But why does my Lord the king want to do such a thing? You see, in the first place, Joab, okay, the general, uh, doesn't agree with the king, you know, telling him to count the troops. How many men can uh, handle a sword, can wield a sword and fight and, and join the army, okay? Because for Joab, you know, is not God enough for us? You know, trust God, right? But, you know, this is a move from Joab to tell his king, that we don't need to do this. We don't need to, uh, to count the troops because this would mean also that we, we really don't fully trust God to come to our defense or, or help us or protect us or, you know, give us victory or triumph over the enemies. Now, but you see uh, the king's word, verse 4 said, the king's word, however, overruled Joab, and the army commanders, so they left the presence of the king to enroll the fighting men of Israel. So they started the census. No. All right. Now let's jump to verse 9. It says, Joab reported the number of the fighting men to the king in Israel. In Israel, there were 800,000 able bodied men who could handle a sword, and in Judah, 500,000. David was conscience stricken <laughs> after he had counted the fighting men and he said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt of, my, of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Now, listen, do you remember, if you remember Gideon, you know, not, not, not uh, our friend Gideon here in Ma. <laughs> but, no. but the thing is this. Gideon, uh, with his men, you know, you know what the Lord told Gideon? He said, you're too many. He said, you know, the Lord has to trim down the number down to 300 to fight a numerous, a countless, a vast army, a, a coalition. Wow. I mean, God, you know, can deliver you even if you are... Too small, too little, you know. So the thing is this, but David did the, the opposite, okay? To Gideon, the Lord wanted him to fight the enemies with a small number of army, okay? But to David, he was like, you know, maybe his, uh, his uh, security blanket will be, you know, knowing that he has a vast number of armies but you see for the lord the lord did not commanded him to do that but he did it anyway but why is it that david did that the bible says the lord what incited him oh really so is is this contradic contradictory okay listen just just wait till we finish this uh, where are we what verse was the last that i read verse yeah uh, yeah, yeah, 10. And so David was, you know, he, he felt sorry. He, he, uh, he had this conviction that he did, he did something wrong. And he recognized that he, it was wrong to come, to, to depend on the number of his force. Okay? And so <clears throat> he said to the Lord, verse 10, I have sinned greatly. So he acknowledged it. Remember that. I have sinned greatly in what I have done. Now, Lord, I beg you, take away the guilt from your servant. I have done a very foolish thing. Now, before David got up the next morning, verse 11, the word of the Lord had come to God, the prophet David seer. Go and tell David, this is what the Lord says. I am giving you three Ye options okay now this is this is uh, where the, the the second threat of famine uh, comes in the lord says i am giving you three options choose one of them for me to carry out against you why against you <laughs> why against david it is because of his sin what kind of sin he counted how many 
soldiers he got. What? Is that a sin? Is that a grievous sin? Is that something that is worth that punishment? Okay, let's let's continue to read. Where were, were we? 13. So God went to David. I mean, God, not God, that's G-O-D, G-A-D. Okay, God the prophet went to David and said to him, Shall there come on you three years of famine? Okay, number one option is what? Famine in your land. How many? Three years. Okay. Three years. That's God's number. Three years of famine or three months of fleeing from your enemies while they pursue you. Okay, meaning to say they're going to be uh, defeated in a battle. And they're going to be fleeing from their enemies with the enemy slaying their soldiers. Or, number three, the third option was, or three days of plague in your land. Or in another version, three days of uh, pestilence. In our version, three days of pandemic, <laughs> epidemic. So you see the, the famine, the pandemic, and war, you know, in this... Uh, in this scenario, you know, it's something that God can allow uh, as a form of judgment. Because, you know, his people have sinned against him. Now, I'm not judging uh, the, or what uh, recently what's happening in the world. But this is a story in the past that we can learn from, okay? Something to learn from. Verse 14 says, David said to God, I mean the prophet, I am in deep distress. Let us fall in the hands of the Lord, for His mercy is great. But do not let me fall into human hands. Meaning, he chose number three. Option number three, pandemic or pestilence or plague, epidemic. He, he chose option three. So the Lord sent the, a plague or a pestilence on Israel from that morning until the end of the time designated. So that's, that's three, three days. And 70,000 of the people of Dan to Beersheba died. So where is his army now? Okay. 70,000. Okay. So look. Uh, Joab reported in verse 9 that they were what? 800 thousand oh that's a lot uh, uh able-bodied men who could handle the sword etc etc but you see they just lost how many um seventy thousand verse 15 seventy thousand of the people from dan to Beersheba died. now look listen why did god allow this why did god discipline david after he took a census you know was it because David did not uh, trust God enough to deliver them that he commanded uh, his uh, captain of the troops or the, his general to, to, to count how many uh, armies they have? Or is it something that God allowed so Israel can pay for something that they did against God that caused God, that provoked God to anger against Israel? I think... You may argue with me and say, well, uh, David did not really trust God when he acted and, and told Joel to come to, to do a census. And, um, you know, okay, no problem with that. You know, it, it's not something that, is, that I will say it's wrong. But there is something, there is a truth behind what, you, what happened in the natural realm. I mean, behind the curtain that we need to understand. Again, I will repeat, God is a God of love. Okay, His very nature is love. God is love, but He is holy and He is just. And so, you know, He will serve justice. And why am I saying this? Because I want you guys, every one of you who are watching this, to understand. Because one day soon we will stand before God. And if you don't know who He is... You will be terrified and you'll be shocked and you will have no time to amend your ways and your doings. And now is the time 
where you can repent from sin, change your ways, because knowing that God is just, and therefore you need to fear Him. Why, what do you mean fear Him? Is he, God is a terrorist? No, God is not a terrorist. But you fear Him and you say, you should love Him enough that you don't want Him hurt. You don't want Him offended. You know, if you love him, love God so much, you don't want him hurt. Do you understand? That is how, that is what we meant by, you know, for me, uh, to love someone is to fear someone, fear uh, not to offend someone. Okay? And so, here's the, here's the thing, here's the point. Okay? First Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, reading again verse 1, it says, Again, the anger of the Lord burned against who? Israel. And he incited David against them, saying, Go and take a census of Israel. So meaning to say, God allowed it. Okay? It's like, it's, it's like God orchestrating that David would tell Joab to count, to, 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 to do a census. Okay? But, but the thing is, and then, then David was blamed for it, and, and David felt guilty that he did that. But, you know, behind the scene, it was God allowing it. That David would be tempted, but it was not God who really pushed David to do it. But God allowed, permitted, that it, could, uh, that it would happen that David would, uh, would, uh, would, uh, would do such a sin against God, but it was not God who moved David to do it, but the Bible is incited. But you see, if you read 1 Chronicles 21.1, the same story, okay? The same story. 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1 says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. Look, is the Bible contradictory in Samuel chapter 24? The Bible says, uh, God incited David, okay? And uh, in First Chronicles 21, it says, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. So it's, you know, look, listen, listen, listen. Oh, hold on just a minute. Okay. I know this is confusing. But there is, you know, in the Bible school, we tell our students a lot of incidents in the Old Testament where it was like the Lord who was doing evil to people, but it was not the Lord. It was the enemy. It was the devil who was doing evil, but was permitted by God. And one of the, one of the famous story that I can pick for the sake of time. Okay, we're not in a Bible school, so I, I, I understand. So I want to make it very simple. Uh, if you are familiar, and if you're not familiar with this story, please read it, okay? Read the story of Job. You know what happened to Job? Uh, the Bible says, you know, the Lord this, da, 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 da. But if you really read it through, you realize it, it was not the Lord. But Job and his uh, friends, you know, attributed those things that was done by God because, you know, Job did something that provoked God to anger, so on and so forth. But here's the thing. It was not God. But God permitted it. It was a test to Job. So here's the thing. The same story uh, here. The same, uh, the same thing. Like the story of Job. Okay. It was, again, it was not really God. But the devil tested Job with God's permission. Okay. Again, uh, God was not pleased with Israel. Go back to first, uh, 2 Samuel 24, verse 1. God was not pleased with Israel. And so, since Satan knew, okay, Satan knew that God was angry with Israel. And so, Satan took advantage and he knew it. And, uh, and, and he knew that God would give him permission to uh, somehow, because the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And so, uh, the devil... Uh, I mean, God was angry with Israel, and so Satan requested that uh, permission to tempt David. Okay, so uh, we're assuming this. This is not really written literally in scriptures, but you, you try to connect the dots. You understand from the story of Job and from the story of, you know, many stories in the Old Testament. And this story, you will see, uh, we see that it was the devil, really, 
whom God permitted because God is holy. He cannot do it. He cannot do evil. God is not evil. But if somebody did something, but in order for that someone to pay for uh, the consequence of his wrong choice, God would allow the enemy to attack. God would, would allow the enemy to harass. Why? Because that someone has done something wrong and, and, and that's it. So you see, evil uh, at the, in our present world has a purpose. Okay? Um, because God is good, He is not bad. So how would God deal with bad people and their bad doings? Of course, there must be someone who is bad <laughs> to deal with the bad people. <laughs> Do you understand? Now, we know that God granted the devil permission. And, and why, again, why would God allow such evil? Again, He is just and holy. If he allows something, it is because he has a purpose that we don't usually know about. Uh, in case Israel sinned against him uh, and by allowing such evil, he will, they, I mean, Israel will pay for the wrong they did against God and hopefully learn the ways of the Lord and start to apply wisdom. What is wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So you also who are, you know, watching this sermon right now, I want you to understand it's time to fear the Lord. Because if you don't live right with God, you know, don't be surprised if one day you will have a topsy turvy, it's a, a, a circus, you know, uh, I mean, you know, a, a cycle of trouble stop you know stop doing things that offends god you know to stop you know uh, unnecessary trouble so i'm asking you i'm begging you i urge you to respect god instead of complaining to god respect god because if you don't respect god i tell you what you do to God will come back to you. You don't respect God. Some people will not respect you. Now think about this. Why are some people, you know, why are they not respecting you? Maybe you're not respecting God in the first place. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of stories here. You know, if we, if we continue, okay, let's just finish this, uh, the last part of the, the, the chapter. Okay, let's read the verse 24 and 25. Did I give that? Verse 24 and 25. 25 only. Okay, so anyway, let's read verse 25 then because uh, that is the only uh, verse I, I uh, submitted. So, David built an altar to the Lord there and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then the Lord, listen to this, then the Lord, answered his prayer in behalf of the land and the plague, the pestilence, the pandemic on Israel was stopped. Why is God like that? Why is he like, you know, overacting about sin? Why is God like uh, overly punishing people when they commit sin against Him. See, you see, the point is, it was not really, uh, you know, about David, you know, his census. But before David and, you know, the census thing, before that happened, the Bible says God was angry with Israel. That's why He incited David. That's why He allowed it to happen, that David would, would count the people, the fighting men. So, and then with that sin, it was too big. You know, the punishment was so gigantic that 70,000 men died in three days. So, so is sin a small thing to God? Does God ta uh, take sins uh, lightly? Of course not. 
sin is a big deal to God. But to us, sin is like a, you know, a, a small thing. Okay, so why? The, uh, the question is still why. So the answer is in God's nature. It's in uh, His character. It's in uh, His attributes. Who is He? God is the creator, and although God is love, He is also just, okay? By saying that He's the creator means that uh, He is far worse than all His creation. So, okay, so, okay, before I read to you the Romans 6.23, let me help you understand what that means, okay? Why death is the penalty for sin, okay? So, imagine this. If you say, if you say let's say, you bruise someone or punch in the face and say a beggar who is in the in the street walking you know uh, maybe you see a crazy person carrying a a sack or i mean he's so dirty he's like what i don't know what we call them the grease the grease person taong grasa in in tagalog but these people are not in their right mind you know they're so uh, dirty and uh, they, they they walk anywhere and and they just you know get their food from the garbage and what do you call that in english you know people who are not in their right mind and uh, they 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 walk in the street they carry a, a sack of whatever they can carry and they eat food from garbages yes in fact this is the funny thing okay Okay, the funny thing is that during the pandemic, at the height of the pandemic, everyone was required to wear a mask and face shield or else uh, you get sick and you see if you're sick, you'll be quarantined, you know, things like that. But these guys, you know, <laughs> this, uh, these people do not wear masks and they walk the streets and we see them and they are not sick. <laughs> They're immune to all sorts of <laughs> of microorganisms, whatever, okay? So our body can handle anything, okay? Because we were designed by God, you know, uh, with an immune system that will develop resistance against all sorts of viruses. So um, anyway, uh, let's go back to our topic. So let's say you punch somebody like that. You know what? If you abuse that person verbally on the street because, you know, he's poor, he's a beggar, he, you know, even if you, uh, you know, as long as no one sees you doing that, you know what? That person will not take you to the to court, okay? Okay? Because that person that you abused has no money, okay, to take the matter to justice, right? And so, because he is poor, and uh, he has no money, no witness, nothing. Therefore, <laughs> what can that person do? He's worth nothing. Okay? So, you, you know, you go your way and no trouble, right? But imagine if you punch and brutally injured the president of the Philippines. Okay, you punch the president of the Philippines in the face and knock him off, let's just say. And just for example, I know you will not do that, but I want you to just, you know, do your, uh, imagine if you did that to the president of the Philippines. What would happen to you? Whoa, it will not be nice, right? Now, what if you punch the face of the president or, or the, the, the prime minister of China? How about that? Or <laughs> what if you, you know, you injured, you did that to uh, the president of Russia? What will happen to you? What could happen to you after that? After you, you know, injuring, uh, doing harm to the president of the, those super countries? Man. It might cost you your very life, right? Your punch to the beggar might not have any effect at all, okay, on you. But you, you punching the president of, of Russia will cost you something. 
Okay, that is just an example, okay? What I'm trying to say is this. The contrast is this. To make it simple, okay? It's like your punch is equivalent to a bullet in your head, okay? That's, that's not good news, I know. But the difference between uh, punching a beggar and punching the leader of a super of a state why you won't be in trouble with a beggar but you will be in a whole lot of trouble with the president that you you know you did harm okay the the, the difference is that they're worth to you the beggar doesn't worth anything but you see the president that you did wrong is worth i mean they represent their country okay that's their value that's their price that's their you know that's their worth so imagine that you doing that to the republic of the philippines to the republic of a certain state and country you understand so how huge is the offense that you've done to, to a person who represents the country? The same thing, friends. Now, if, if, uh, if injuring a president, you know, if harming a president could cost your life, imagine this. What, if, you know, what is the price of you you know, provoking or, or offending the Creator. So how much more with God? If with the President, you, you know, it, it, you may, it may cost you your life, but with God, He owns everything. He created all things. You know, if, let's say, you zoom out, Okay, zoom out, zoom out, zoom out to see the, the planet Earth. You will, you will not see anyone. You will not see people because they're so, uh, so small when you're in space viewing the Earth, right? Now, if you continue to zoom out, zoom out, zoom out so you can see the Earth, the moon, and the sun, okay? Zoom out again, zoom out so you can see the whole universe, the stars, and you cannot see the Earth because the Earth is too tiny, you know, in the whole universe. Now listen to this. God is greater than the whole universe. So how small are we? Do you understand the difference between us and God? God who created the whole universe? Now if, if you sin against uh, a, a person who is in high power and authority if it will cost you your life how much more with the one who owns everything you understand and even our very breath our lives are not our own so what can we pay him for this for the thing that we've, we've done wrong nothing actually nothing that's why the bible says can you uh, uh, show it to them, uh, Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life um, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Okay, the, uh, the wages or the penalty or the payment for sin is what? Is death. So, guys, <laughs> that's it. Uh, that's why... What we just read, you know, at the beginning of this uh, sermon, we feel like, what, Lord? Why are you punishing Israel so hard with just a simple sin? No, no, no. It's not about, it's not just the sin. It's who you are offending. That's why I told you last week that if there's someone you and I must not offend, and that is who? That's God. That's God. That's why I'm encouraging you to fear God. I want to read that. Last Sunday, I said this, okay? I said, if there's someone you and I must not hurt or offend, that's the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is God's Spirit representing the Father and the Son who was sent on earth. And I told you this. 
do not hurt the Holy Spirit. You hurt yourself when you hurt the Holy Spirit. Remember that? Okay, again, let me read that to you. Do not hurt the Holy Spirit. You hurt yourself when you hurt the Holy Spirit. Instead, learn to love and respect Him because only He can make you holy, happy, and productive. So guys, I think uh, I have to cut this uh, sermon um, because uh, we have to go to the next uh, service. <laughs> okay, but we love you all. I hope uh, this is a big sermon uh, uh, to you and I hope that uh, you understand that uh, we're all sinners before God we were born enemies of the cross therefore if you're not born again Jesus said you know uh, the Lord Jesus Christ said unless a man be born again he cannot see the kingdom of God okay because if you're not born again you're still in sin and God will judge us okay for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God when you say uh, the, the standard of God's holiness is still higher than our best righteous acts, than our best deeds. So your good deeds, all your good works will not pass it. So you cannot earn salvation by doing good, by religiously go to, going to church. Listen up, friends. The only way, your only ticket out of judgment is Jesus. Jesus paid the price, so you don't need to die for your sins anymore. Okay? Do you understand that? Therefore, we must be born again. Jesus said, unless a man be born again. And he told the priest Nicodemus in John 3, 7, he said, I tell you, do not marvel that I say to you. Do not be surprised if I tell you, you must be born again. That's not a suggestion, friends. It's a command. You must be born again. Okay, John chapter 3, verse 7. Now, if you want to be born again, contact us, please. Okay, so we're going to go right now. God bless you. Let's pray. Lord, and now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord makes His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of His countenance upon you and give you His peace both now and forevermore. And all of God's people say, Amen. And I said, for some of you, let's see you in our next service. And, and, and to those of you who are attending uh, online, uh, see you again next week, okay? As we continue with our series on famines in the Bible. I hope you learned a lot. You learned something today. You will learn more if you join us again next week. Bye-bye. God bless.